Chapter 31. The Irresistible Breakfast. Blake stared at the book on the table, its contents suddenly rendered meaningless after a brief glance. With a scratch of his head, he mused, I really am diligent. His attention then shifted to his magic wand, which he twirled fondly for a moment before stowing it away in the system warehouse. Given the current circumstances, he couldn't openly carry it. Blake had resolved to commission Ollivander to craft a wand identical to his own so he could wield it without arousing suspicion. If Ollivander refused to customize the wand's appearance, Blake would have to accept whatever design was offered. With this plan in mind, Blake left his room, intent on starting his day with breakfast before planning his activities. Upon arriving at the bar counter of the Leaky Cauldron, Blake was greeted by the sight of stale bread and dry steaks on the customer's plates. He sighed, acknowledging that the establishment's affordability was its only redeeming feature. Approaching Tom, the bar's proprietor, Blake inquired, Boss, may I use your kitchen? Tom responded, Feel free to use it, but you'll need to pay for any ingredients you use unless you bring your own. Blake casually tossed a gold coin to Tom, who caught it with ease and noted Blake's name in a ledger, saying, I'll deduct the cost of the ingredients you use. Understood, Blake replied, before dashing into the kitchen. Thanks to the system's resources, Blake had access to exquisite ingredients. His cooking skills, already perfected at an intermediate level, had only improved. Soon, the tantalizing aroma of frying steak wafted from the kitchen, drawing curious glances from the other patrons. The scent was unusually appetizing, prompting one customer to exclaim, Boss! Is that steak being cooked in the back? I want one. Tom, busy with his ledger, explained, That's a customer preparing his own meal. I'm afraid I can't take orders for it. As Tom spoke, Blake emerged from the kitchen with two perfectly cooked steaks. Observing this, Tom added another entry next to Blake's name. Blake, ignoring the attention he was attracting, sat down to enjoy his meal. Ah, the wonders of the system's supreme-grade cooking proficiency, he thought, nearly moved to tears by the steak's exquisite flavor. Just then, a sleepy Hannah descended from upstairs. Good morning, Hannah. Blake greeted her cheerfully. Good, good morning, Hannah replied, her usual shyness less evident. I'd like to treat you to breakfast as a thank you for your help yesterday, Blake offered, sliding the extra steak across the table. Tom watched the exchange with interest, realizing why Blake had prepared two servings. Hannah hesitated, initially inclined to decline. However, the irresistible aroma of the steak weakened her resolve. Before she knew it, she was seated next to Blake, fork in hand, poised to taste the steak she had intended to refuse. Why am I doing this? She wondered silently, her rationality clashing with her instincts. Despite her internal protests, her body acted on its own, drawn by the steak's enticing scent. Ultimately, Hannah surrendered to her desire, closing her eyes as she savored the delicious bite. In that moment, it was clear, though she might have wanted to say no, the honesty of her appetite, captivated by the fragrance of the steak, spoke volumes. Hannah bit into the food, her eyes widening in surprise. It's, it's delicious. The meat was tender and juicy, with a texture that was simply unparalleled. Hannah had always prided herself on her cooking skills, but this, this was a revelation. Oh no, what if I can never enjoy such delicious food again, she lamented. Suddenly, a chime sounded in her head. Ding, detected the emotion of joy. Another chime followed. Ding, congratulations to the host for obtaining one silver treasure chest. The delightful meal had made Hannah unusually talkative, particularly when she sought Blake's advice on cooking techniques. After breakfast, Blake, feeling rejuvenated, made his way to Diagon, Alley once more. His visit the previous day had been somewhat restricted with Dumbledore by his side, leaving many places unexplored. One such place was Ollivander's shop, which he had missed. Today, however, he had a different destination in mind. The Herb Shop. Blake had visited the shop briefly the day before, but had been unable to purchase certain seeds due to Dumbledore's presence. Today was different. As he approached the entrance of the herb shop, fate seemed to have a sense of humor, for he spotted a familiar green figure. Cassandra was crouched at the entrance, meticulously selecting seeds. A slight smile played on Blake's lips at the sight. It seemed he was about to gain another treasure chest. Intentionally making his footsteps louder, Blake caught Cassandra's attention. 
he made no move to speak to her, planning instead to walk past. However, Cassandra called out to him. Wait, Blake's smile widened. He had anticipated this. Cassandra, known for her expertise in herbology, had likely recognized him from their encounter at the wand shop. Her pride would not allow her to miss an opportunity for retribution. My name is Cassandra Worley, she said with a hint of arrogance, acknowledging their previous meeting. Oh, so it's you, Blake responded, feigning surprise. Hello, Miss Worley. My name is Blake, Blake Green. He then gave her a scrutinizing look before commenting, Miss Worley, is there something wrong with your neck? You seem to be looking up quite a bit. It might be wise to consult a doctor. After all, it's quite unladylike to have one's nostrils on display. Cassandra stiffened, her composure nearly shattered by Blake's remarks. Accustomed to carrying herself with grace, she found the insinuation of being unladylike intolerable. Ding! Anger detected! The familiar chime sounded in Blake's head, followed by, Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining a silver treasure chest. Blake couldn't help but smirk at his own cunning. I'll anger you to death, he thought, confident that Cassandra wouldn't simply walk away. Her desire for revenge was too strong. As expected, Cassandra took several deep breaths to calm herself, choosing to ignore Blake's previous comments. Are you here to buy herb seeds as well? She asked, attempting to steer the conversation back to a more neutral topic. Oh, of course. I have a bit of an interest in herbology myself, Blake replied nonchalantly, as if completely oblivious to Cassandra's hostility. P.S. Striving for ten chapters today. Your support through flowers, monthly votes, and evaluation votes means the world to me. Chapter 32. Cassandra's Frustration Cassandra was seething with frustration. I'm so mad. Why am I not even as good as him in herbalism, she thought, glaring at Blake. Her attempt to regain some ground in their ongoing rivalry had backfired spectacularly. Blake, sensing her agitation, couldn't help but feel amused internally. Yet he maintained a composed exterior. Is that so? Then do you recognize this seed? He asked, pointing to a seed Cassandra had been examining moments earlier. Without waiting for her response, Blake continued. This is the seed of blackroot grass, Miss Worley. Blackroot grass is quite remarkable. Consuming it can mitigate some of the damage caused by magic. Its roots are jet black, contrasting sharply with its pure white flowers, making it quite distinctive. Cassandra bit her lip in irritation. She hadn't asked for a lecture. Yet here he was, dispensing knowledge as if she were a novice. Did I ask you? You just went on and on, she thought, even though she had to admit he was correct. Before she could retort, Blake spoke again, his tone still even. Miss Worley, your eagerness to learn is commendable. Even during a casual outing, you seize the opportunity to expand your knowledge. Since you seemed puzzled, I felt compelled to share what I know. I hope you don't mind. And if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. I'm happy to share my knowledge. Cassandra was dumbfounded. What does he mean by saying I seemed puzzled and asked for his advice? Wasn't I testing him? How did this turn into him tutoring me? She thought, her frustration mounting. Who doesn't know about blackroot grass? My family is in the herbal medicine business, for heaven's sake. Her anger, which she had barely managed to suppress, flared up once more. However, before she could express it, Blake continued, Many assume that growing black root grass is straightforward. Just plant the roots in soil. But that's a misconception. Cassandra was incensed. Who doesn't know that? She thought scornfully. Blake, undeterred, went on, While that method might work, it limits the plant's growth to a mere 15 inches. However, by employing the grafting method I've developed, you can grow black root grass up to 30 inches tall, significantly enhancing its medicinal properties. This method involves grafting blackroot grass with the guardian tree, a technique I discovered that yields remarkable results. Cassandra initially wanted to interrupt him, but as Blake detailed his innovative approach to cultivating blackroot grass, including the principles behind it, she found herself listening intently. The more she heard, the more viable his method seemed. By the time Blake finished explaining, Cassandra was eager to rush home and try it out herself. Staring at Blake in disbelief, Cassandra realized that her attempt to outshine him in herbalism had utterly failed. Blake's knowledge and innovative techniques in the field far surpassed her own. 
The realization was a bitter pill to swallow for someone as proud as Cassandra. She had always considered herbalism her forte, yet here she was, outclassed by Blake. As Blake observed Cassandra's crestfallen expression, a slight smile played on his lips. He had acquired all his herbalism knowledge the previous night, thanks to a treasure chest that ironically came from Cassandra herself. Despite only achieving beginner proficiency in herbalism, Blake's natural talent and the intensive study session had propelled his understanding and innovation in the field well beyond Cassandra's. Blake's talent as a student was undeniable, especially when it came to herbology. His innovative grafting technique caught the attention of many, including Cassandra's parents, who were compelled to study it closely despite their extensive knowledge. Cassandra herself, having only scratched the surface of herbology, found Blake's technique particularly impressive. Unfortunately, her luck seemed to be waning today, as she only managed to find silver treasure chests. Blake, however, remained unfazed by this minor set, back, valuing the experience over the rewards. Miss Worley? Blake called out gently, noticing Cassandra's distant demeanor. It appeared his demonstration had overwhelmed her, leaving her momentarily unresponsive. Shaking his head slightly, Blake mused about the lack of a gold treasure chest, half-jokingly accusing the system of taking a commission before deciding to leave Cassandra to her thoughts and head into the herb shop. The shop was run by a middle-aged witch whose appearance was a bit unkempt, a testament to her dedication to growing and studying herbs. Greeting Blake with a warm smile, she mistook him for a first-year student in need of potion ingredients. Do you sell seeds here? Blake inquired, his politeness masking his eagerness. Of course, we have a variety of herb seeds for sale, the shopkeeper responded, her kindness evident. Excited, Blake listed the seeds he was interested in, mandrake, venomous tentacula, and biting kale. The shopkeeper's demeanor changed instantly, her smile vanishing as she pointed towards the door and softly commanded, Get out! Blake, realizing his mistake in requesting seeds of such dangerous plants from a reputable shop, scratched his head in confusion and left pondering his next move. Why not try owl online shopping, he thought aloud, stepping outside. Cassandra, having observed the entire exchange, confronted Blake with a mix of hostility and jealousy. Why would you want those dangerous seeds, she asked, baffled by his intentions. To plant them, of course. What's the harm in having a few dangerous plants? Blake retorted, his casual dismissal leaving Cassandra at a loss for words. After a moment of silence, Cassandra, driven by a mix of rivalry and intrigue, offered a solution. I know where you can get those seeds, she said, her voice low. Where? Blake asked, his interest piqued. Nocturne Alley, she whispered. Blake's eyes lit up with excitement. Yes, he exclaimed, slapping his thigh in determination. If reputable sources wouldn't sell to him, he'd turn to less scrupulous ones. The dangers of Nocturne Alley didn't intimidate him. After all, he was armed with a 15-inch wand and ready to face any challenge. P.S. Dear readers, your support through comments, votes, and reviews means the world to me. It motivates me to release more chapters and continue sharing this adventure with you. Thank you. Chapter 33. A Momentary Detour for a Robbery Blake extended his gratitude to Cassandra with a polite thank you, then bid her farewell and departed. He was familiar with the location of Tumble Alley, having passed by its intersection just the day before. Dumbledore had warned him about it, describing it as a dangerous place teeming with unsavory characters and advising him to steer clear. However, Dumbledore was unaware of Blake's stubborn streak. Despite knowing the risks, Blake was determined to venture in. As Blake walked away, Cassandra watched him go, her expression a complex mix of emotions. Aware of the dangers that lurked within Tumble Alley, Blake wanted to avoid drawing unnecessary attention upon his arrival. To blend in, he took out a coat and, with a flick of his magic wand, transformed it into a cloak complete with a face scarf. He meticulously checked his disguise to ensure there were no flaws before confidently stepping into the infamous Tumble Alley. Tumble Alley was a lawless place, largely ignored by the Ministry of Magic. Its inhabitants were often those who lived on the fringes of society, and the alley itself was a stark contrast to the bustling Diagon Alley. The shops and the pavement were in a state of disrepair, and the people hurried about with a sense of urgency. Shopkeepers, 
with their menacing appearances, seem to embody the essence of malevolence. The merchandise available was equally dubious, ranging from black magic artifacts to grotesque materials of uncertain origin. To the average onlooker, these items would be terrifying, but Blake viewed them with keen interest. He found Tumble Alley intriguing, despite its off-putting odor and the questionable nature of its goods. His purpose was not just to find the seeds he was after, but to explore the alley for other interesting finds. It wasn't long before something caught Blake's eye, a shop that reeked of blood, with visible bloodstains marking its entrance. It was a butcher's shop, dealing in the meat of magical creatures hunted despite legal protections. What piqued Blake's interest, however, was not the shop itself, but a small cage placed outside. Inside, a tiny black creature huddled in a corner, trembling. With just a glance, Blake recognized it as a sniff. Blake had been considering acquiring a sniff for its cuteness and its remarkable ability to attract attention, making it a valuable ally. Unfortunately, the magical pet shops in Diagon Alley did not sell sniffs. Seeing this one in such dire circumstances, Blake decided to purchase it, not only because he wanted a sniff, but also to save it from a grim fate. You're interested in buying this sniff? A voice suddenly interrupted his thoughts. Blake looked up to see a shirtless, portly man wearing suspenders standing at the shop's entrance. Yes, I want to buy this sniff, Blake confirmed. The man chuckled, all right, if you can afford it. Blake, curious and undeterred, asked, how much? One thousand gold galleons, the portly man declared with a malevolent grin. Blake exhaled in frustration. He had encountered a robber. Then, I'm afraid I must decline your offer, Blake responded, maintaining a polite smile. Hey, hey. You don't really have a choice now, the corpulent man chuckled. Suddenly, Blake found himself encircled by seven or eight individuals in the alley. Don't assume I can't tell you're just a kid under all those layers, one of them taunted. What do you want? Blake inquired, his patience wearing thin. It's been a while since I've had a good meal. Hey, hey, grab him, the leader commanded. Some youngsters never learn their place, thinking they can just wander into Nocturne Alley to satisfy their curiosity another sneered. Realizing his disguise had been seen through, Blake removed his cloak. As I said, I won't be buying that, he stated firmly. And why is that? They jeered. Because, Blake drew his wand with a flourish, I plan to rob you instead. Hand over anything of value or interest you have on you, he demanded. The group, including t Pet, he fat man, paused, taken aback before bursting into laughter. Oh, you really don't know when to quit, do you? They mocked, closing in on him. Unfazed, Blake raised his wand, ready to make his move. Stop! But just as he was about to act, an unexpected interruption came. Who's interfering now? The fat man grumbled, looking toward the alley's entrance. Blake's gaze followed. Near the entrance stood a girl, around thirteen or fourteen, with curly hair and a nervous expression. Stop! Stop! Let that boy go! She demanded, pointing her wand at the fat man. Blake, still encircled, was taken aback by the girl's sudden appearance. He scratched his head, puzzled, as he didn't recognize her. <sighs> Fine, I'll let him go. I'd rather avoid trouble, the fat man conceded, signaling his gang to clear a path. Come, take the boy and leave before I change my mind, he urged. The girl, upon hearing this, rushed over. Blake sighed, touched by her naivety, but also concerned. Did she truly believe the words of these scoundrels? As she approached, Blake's expression conveyed his skepticism. Predictably, as soon as she entered, the gang blocked the alley's entrance, cutting off any view from Diagon Alley and trapping them both. You, you didn't keep your promise, the girl exclaimed, realizing the deceit. Ahem, one moment, Blake interjected, placing a hand on her shoulder. But we, she started. Just wait, I have something to take care of first. What's that? Nothing much, just a robbery, Blake clarified his tone casual yet firm. Under the girl's astonished gaze, Blake raised his wand once more. I already said this was a robbery. Are you all deaf? Hand over your money and anything else of interest. P.S. Dear readers, your support through comments, votes, and reviews means the world to me. Can you guess who this brave young lady is? Chapter 34. Dumbledore. He's my son. Um, huh? In a moment of desperation, the burly man lunged towards Blake, intent on seizing him. His mind raced with cruel plans, to beat the boy senseless, then decide whether to sell him off or butcher him for meat. 
the little girl's fate in his mind was even more sinister. As for the magic wand in Blake's grasp, he scoffed at the thought. To him, a wand wielded by an eleven-year-old was no more menacing than a toothpick, which, in his opinion, could inflict more pain if it pricked someone. However, Blake had other plans. With a decisive flick of his wand, he unleashed a powerful weather spell. In an instant, the sky crackled, and a massive bolt of lightning, like a wild serpent unleashed, struck down with ferocity. The air was filled with the scent of ozone as the lightning ravaged the street, leaving those who had dared to threaten Blake and the girl charred beyond recognition. Their bodies lay twitching on the ground, a testament to the spell's power. Even the black wizards, who had been observing from a distance with a mix of curiosity and malice, found themselves retreating hastily, no longer willing to confront the young sorcerer's might. The curly-haired girl, miraculously unharmed, stood beside Blake, her beautiful curls now frizzed and standing on end from the static charge of the spell. She was in a state of shock, her mind struggling to comprehend what had just occurred. An eleven-year-old boy had just single-handedly defeated a group of dark sorcerers with a display of magic that was both awe-inspiring and terrifying. Blake, meanwhile, continued to lecture the unconscious man on the ground about the ethics of robbery, all the while effortlessly lifting him with one hand and tossing him into the middle of the street as if he weighed nothing. The display of strength was astonishing, hinting at Blake's proficiency not just in magic but in physical combat as well. The curly-haired girl, still in disbelief, pinched herself, hoping to wake from what she believed was a vivid dream. The pain that followed, however, confirmed the reality of her situation. She looked at Blake, tears forming in her eyes, not from pain but from the overwhelming realization that what she had witnessed was real. Blake, noticing her distress, approached with concern. What's wrong? Are you hurt? The spell was controlled. It shouldn't have harmed you, he said, genuinely puzzled. Through her tears, the girl managed to stammer, I, I'm not dreaming. At that moment, Blake received a notification. A gold treasure chest had been awarded for the extreme shock his actions had caused. Meanwhile, Dumbledore returned to his office, weary from his travels. His recent journey had taken him across half the globe, leaving him exhausted. Yet, the events that unfolded in that distant street would soon demand his attention, adding another layer to the already complex tapestry of the Wizarding World's challenges. Despite his robust health, Dumbledore was feeling the weight of his years. The demands of his dual roles, both at Hogwarts and with the Ministry of Magic, were becoming increasingly difficult to manage. He had resolved to take a well-deserved rest before visiting Diagon Alley to check in on Blake, a thought that filled his heart with a sense of warmth. As he settled into his office, a knock at the door interrupted his musings. Come in, he called out, his voice tinged with fatigue. Professor McGonagall entered briskly, her expression one of relief. Albus, you're finally back. I am, Dumbledore replied with a weary smile. After some rest, I'll be ready to attend to my duties at the school. McGonagall sighed, her concern evident. Albus, I didn't come to rush you back to work. I came to remind you that you're not as young as you once were. Perhaps it's time to let Fudge handle the Ministry's affairs on his own. Dumbledore's response took her by surprise. Thank you, Minerva. I will seriously consider your advice. It was an unusual concession from him. Wolf Hei, oh, had always politely dismissed her concerns in the past, continuing his work with the Ministry, regardless. Changing the subject, McGonagall mentioned, Albus, about the boy you spoke of last time. She produced a letter from her robes, the admission letter, for Blake. Should I address it to Blake Grindelwald? No, use just Blake. His last name could bring him unnecessary trouble, Dumbledore advised. McGonagall nodded, putting the envelope away, her gaze lingering on Dumbledore, who had promised to explain everything upon his return. Please, have a seat, Dumbledore offered, gesturing to a chair. Would you like some tea or pumpkin juice? Tea would be lovely, thank you, McGonagall replied, taking a seat across from him. With a tap of his wand, Dumbledore conjured a pot of tea in two cups, filling the air with the comforting aroma of the brew. This matter. I trust you with it, because you understand the significance of that surname, Dumbledore began, his voice serious. But I must ask you to keep this a secret, for the child's sake. 
what Grindelwald did has no bearing on him. McGonagall, understanding the gravity of the situation, nodded in agreement. The name Grindelwald had cast a long shadow over their world, and the thought of any connection to him had filled her with dread during Dumbledore's absence. Don't worry, Grindelwald remains confined in Nurmengard, Dumbledore reassured her, sensing her unease. This is merely a historical footnote, a remnant of Grindelwald's past. Feeling somewhat relieved, McGonagall ventured, Then, this child, who exactly is Grindelwald to him? Dumbledore hesitated, the weight of his next words apparent. It's not just about who Grindelwald is, but rather, the relationship between him and me. McGonagall, puzzled, urged him to continue. Taking a deep breath, Dumbledore finally revealed, Blake, that boy is my son. The revelation was so shocking that McGonagall spat out her tea, staring at Dumbledore with wide, disbelieving eyes. P.S. Dear readers, your support through comments, votes, and feedback is immensely appreciated. Stay tuned for the next chapter, where I'll reveal more about the mysterious sister. Chapter 35, A Revelation and a Rescue. In other words, Professor McGonagall paused, seeking clarification. Strictly speaking, Blake is your and Grindelwald's son. Dumbledore had recently confided in Professor McGonagall about the events of the past few days, including the revelation of Blake's identity. Given that Professor McGonagall had seen the name, Dumbledore found it impossible to keep the truth from her. Fortunately, she was a person of trust. You've already adopted the child. No, rather, you've brought him into the Dumbledore family, haven't you? She inquired. Yes, I took him to Diagon Alley the day before yesterday to purchase his school supplies, Dumbledore confirmed with a nod. Congratulations, Albus, Professor McGonagall said, her smile warm. She was congratulating him not just on finding a relative, but on the fact that, despite his age, Dumbledore had someone to care for him, ensuring he wouldn't face his final days in solitude at St. Mungo's. Thank you, Minerva, Dumbledore replied, touched by her words. If that's the case, Albus, shouldn't you change his surname back to Dumbledore? Now that the child has returned to the Dumbledore family, she suggested thoughtfully. Dumbledore waved his hand dismissively. Everyone knows I've never married or had children. Changing his surname to Dumbledore would only bring unnecessary criticism upon the child. I'm old. Criticism of my personal life doesn't affect me. But Blake, I don't want him to grow up amidst such talk. Professor McGonagall sighed, understanding his point. All right, then I'll regard the child as your adopted son. You're old and chose to adopt. No one will question that. Now I must get back to work. You should take some time to be with the child. Hmm, no wonder the child is so talented in transfiguration. I'm already looking forward to seeing him at school. Cassandra, what's wrong? You've been restless all morning, Mrs. Worley observed with concern. It's nothing. I'll go out for a walk again, Cassandra replied, barely hiding her turmoil. But as soon as she was out of sight, her thoughts raced. She had encountered Blake in Diagon Alley while accompanying her mother. After a brief interaction, her jealousy towards Blake's talents had flared. A dark thought had emerged, to deceive Blake into venturing into Nocturne Alley, a place notorious for its dangers. If he went there, he might not return, and she would regain her status as the prodigious talent. Yet recalling Blake's innocent excitement, Cassandra felt a deep conflict within. He might be harmed because of me. But surely, no one would be foolish enough to venture into Nocturne Alley, right? But he seemed so eager. No, it's not my fault, even if something happens to him there. But I know I was the one who misled him. Torn between her conscience and darker impulses, Cassandra wandered Diagon Alley, lost in thought. Suddenly she spotted a familiar figure. Professor Dumbledore, she called out, running towards him. Hmm, Miss Worley, what's the matter? Dumbledore asked, his good mood evident. Professor, I Blake went into Nocturne Alley. Cassandra blurted out, panic in her voice. What? Let's go. Dumbledore responded immediately, his expression turning serious as he drew his wand, his grip whitening with urgency. In Nocturne Alley, Blake sat leisurely on a sofa, introducing himself to a senior. My name is Blake, Blake Green. And you are? Blake was cradling a small creature in his arms, while next to him, a portly man with a puffy face eagerly served him tea. Nearby, two dark wizards were diligently massaging Blake's legs. My name is Penelope, Penelope Cleavage, she introduced herself, though she quickly added, you can call me Penelope. 
Penelope observed the scene before her with a mix of amusement and disbelief. Moments ago, these dark wizards had been fierce and threatening, their cries for blood chilling the air. Yet now, they were as docile as lambs, attending to the whims of an eleven-year-old wizard. The absurdity of the situation was not lost on her. However, the fact that this young wizard had managed to subdue a group of dark wizards single-handedly was even more astonishing. Senior Penelope, please, have a seat, Blake invited, gesturing to the spacious sofa that seemed too large for him alone. He patted the empty space beside him, signaling for Penelope to join him. There's a lot I'd like to ask you about Hogwarts. Before Penelope could respond, a stern voice echoed from the alleyway, causing Blake to nearly tumble off the sofa in surprise. Professor Dumbledore? Penelope exclaimed, equally startled to see Dumbledore stride into Nocturne Alley, with a young girl in a green dress trailing behind him. The girl's face bore a hint of anxiety, yet her curiosity about the infamous alley was unmistakable. It wasn't until she peeked around Dumbledore that she noticed the peculiar sight of Blake, seated like a king among his subjects, with the once menacing figures now serving him obediently. He's completely fine, she murmured, her astonishment evident. And they're actually serving him? How did he manage that? Despite her shock, Cassandra felt a wave of relief and even happiness for Blake's safety. Blake, care to explain? Dumbledore asked, his tone light yet expectant as he put away his wand. Caught off guard, Blake was momentarily speechless, his mind racing. Then, he received a notification about a silver treasure chest, which only added to his confusion. You? I trusted you so much, and you betrayed me, he exclaimed, though part of him had suspected that the young lady might have lured him into a trap. However, he hadn't anticipated Dumbledore's intervention, nor had he expected to be waiting in Nocturne Alley for the Dark Wizards to procure seeds for him. The Dark Wizards' shock at seeing Dumbledore was palpable. They wondered about the nature of Blake's relationship with the esteemed wizard. Was he a relative, or why else would Dumbledore show such concern? The sight of Dumbledore drawing his wand had sent the portly man into such a panic that he felt as if he'd lost weight from fear alone. If only I'd known about his powerful ally sooner, he lamented internally, regretting any hostility towards Blake. P.S. Dear readers, your support through comments, votes, and reviews means the world to me. I promise to complete the Diagon Alley storyline today. Chapter 36 The House Elf Baker Cassandra's expression soured when she overheard Blake referring to her as a snitch. Hmph. I... I was just concerned you might meet your end in Nocturne Alley, she protested. All right, Blake. Miss Warren is simply concerned for your well-being, Dumbledore interjected, his tone soothing yet firm. I wasn't worried about him, Cassandra muttered under her breath. Dumbledore continued, his voice calm but carrying an undeniable weight, and have I not mentioned before, you should avoid Nocturne Alley. Blake felt the gravity of Dumbledore's words pressing down on him. I was wrong, he conceded, bowing his head in acknowledgement of his mistake. Yet, despite his apparent contrition, Blake harbored a secret. Unbeknownst to Dumbledore, Blake had mastered the beginner's brain seal spell from his newbie gift pack. Thus, when Dumbledore employed the mind capture spell to gauge the sincerity of Blake's apology, he was misled into believing Blake's remorse was genuine and decided not to pursue the matter further. After all, Blake seemed unharmed, didn't he? Dumbledore's attention then shifted to Penelope. And you, Miss Cleavage, what brings you here? He inquired with a gentle smile. Penelope glanced at Blake before explaining her predicament. She felt somewhat wronged. Her intentions had been purely to rescue the boy, but she ended up being deceived herself. Sharing her story made her feel slightly embarrassed, yet she knew honesty was her best course. Meanwhile, the Dark Warlock was in a state of utter despair. Not only had he attempted to capture a child under Dumbledore's protection, but he had also planned to kidnap a student in broad daylight. Looking up at the sky, he resigned himself to his fate, realizing resistance was futile against the formidable duo of Dumbledore and Blake. If only he had paid more attention during his phantom transfiguration lessons, he might have had a chance to escape. But now, caught in Dumbledore's terrifying gaze, he felt his resolve crumble. Dumbledore then praised Penelope. Your bravery is commendable, Miss Cleavage. However, he quickly added a word of caution, 
But remember, before acting heroically, you must ensure your own safety first. He stressed the importance of self-preservation, pointing out that reckless actions could jeopardize not only the individual's safety, but also the chance of saving others. Penelope nodded, feeling a mix of pride and shame. As a Ravenclaw, she regretted being so easily duped. She realized that had she informed Blake or sought help from an Auror, they might have avoided the danger altogether. Dumbledore concluded, you're young and haven't been exposed to the darker aspects of the world. Now, please wait for me at the Leaky Cauldron. I have matters to attend to here in Nocturne Alley and will join you shortly. As Blake and the others left Nocturne Alley, Penelope breathed a sigh of relief, vowing never to return. Cassandra, however, cast a complicated glance at Blake before departing abruptly, claiming she had no time for a meal. Blake was puzzled by Cassandra's reaction. Her anger in Nocturne Alley had been palpable, yet it hadn't triggered a reward from the system. He wondered if there was a limit to such rewards, but dismissed the thought, expecting the system to notify him if that were the case. Penelope then returned Sniff to Blake, expressing her gratitude for his help, but declining his invitation to dine together. Blake sighed, feeling the weight of responsibility on his shoulders. I've been out for so long, my family will be worried. With no other option, Blake had to make his way back to the leaky cauldron alone. First, he made sure to secure Sniff in his room, sternly advising the creature not to wander off. Despite Sniff's usual disregard for instructions, being ten pounds in weight and nine pounds worth of rebellion, Blake's status as an archdruid commanded some level of obedience. While waiting, Blake decided to utilize his time productively by heading to the kitchen of the leaky cauldron or prepare a lavish lunch. Dumbledore's arrival at the tavern was met with astonishment at Blake's culinary prowess, earning Blake another silver treasure chest for his efforts. After the meal, Blake's curiosity got the better of him. What happened to those dark wizards? he inquired. Dumbledore, with a tone of finality, responded, I've handed them over to the Aurors. The Ministry of Magic will handle the rest. Blake nodded, understanding the implications. Unless something unexpected occurred, those dark wizards would likely spend a considerable amount of time in Azkaban. He felt a twinge of regret. Dumbledore's timely intervention meant those wizards hadn't had the chance to procure the seeds Blake had hoped for. Thus, his trip to Nocturne Alley had been in vain. Dumbledore's visit was brief and he soon departed from Diagon Alley, unable to spend the entire day with Blake. After seeing Dumbledore off, Blake planned to return to his room for a nap before heading to Ollivander's wand shop later in the afternoon. However, upon entering his room, Blake immediately sensed that something was amiss. The room was spotless, unnaturally so. Earlier, when he had returned Sniff to the room, his books had been strewn about in disarray. Now, the bed was meticulously made, the books organized by category, and the old floorboards shone with cleanliness. Something was definitely wrong. Blake doubted Tom, the innkeeper, would go to such lengths. The cleanliness of the floor alone raised suspicions. Suddenly, Sniff's cries from the table caught Blake's attention. The creature gestured frantically, conveying a message only Blake could understand. Drawing his wand, Blake fixed his gaze on a corner of the room. Come out, he commanded. Whose house elf are you? I'll count to three. Three. With a loud bang, a scrawny house elf appeared before Blake, looking at him with fear. Little master? Blake asked, sitting down on the bed trying to make sense of the situation. Whose house elf are you? The house elf, trembling, replied, Beck? Beck is a house elf of the Grindelwald family. Blake's eyes widened in shock. The Grindelwald family? Chapter 37 Pets Should Be Grand A shocking revelation. Blake was taken aback. The house elf before him, Beck, was actually from the Grindelwald family? This revelation meant that Grindelwald himself had taken notice of Blake. Beck, with a hint of pride in his voice, explained, Beck has served the Grindelwald family for generations. My father, Gucci, currently tends to the old master at Nurmengard. He recommended me to serve the old master directly, and I was accepted. Understanding dawned on Blake. He knew he had to inform Dumbledore about this development immediately. The intricacies of wizarding politics were not his concern. He was more focused on practical matters at the moment. Looks like I need to buy an owl, Blake mused. 
Without one, communicating with Dumbledore would be a hassle. Beck, let's go shopping, Blake announced, deciding to make the most out of having a house elf sent by Grindelwald himself. Unlike Hermione, Blake wasn't particularly troubled by the plight of house elves or intent on dismantling their servitude. He simply aimed to treat his own elf a bit better than the norm. Leaving Sniff behind, Blake and Beck headed to the Owl Emporium. Upon their arrival, the shop assistant eagerly showcased various owls, recognizing Blake as a member of an ancient wizarding family, a potential big spender. However, none of the owls caught Blake's attention until he spotted a massive eagle owl lurking in a corner. Its sheer size was enough to make Blake decide on the spot. I want that one, he declared. The shop assistant hesitated, explaining, that eagle owl hasn't been fully tamed yet. It's still quite wild and has been known to lash out. Blake, undeterred and even more intrigued, approached the eagle owl. It was the first creature he had encountered that seemed utterly unaffected by his archdruid aura. How about this, Blake proposed. If I can get it to follow me, you give me a 10% discount. The clerk, seeing no harm in the deal since the owl had been difficult to sell due to its temperament and appetite, agreed. If you can truly tame it, it's yours. Blake then made an offer to the eagle owl, promising a diet far more appealing than the owl biscuits it was currently subjected to. The eagle owl, seemingly understanding, immediately showed interest. Let's go home, Blake said with a smile, extending his arm for the eagle owl to perch upon. The shop assistant and the onlookers were left in awe. Despite his youth, Blake had not only chosen one of the most challenging pets, but had also managed to win it over effortlessly. With a few words, Blake had convinced the giant eagle owl to accompany him, leaving the shop assistant and the onlookers in disbelief. Their skepticism was evident. They couldn't fathom how Blake, with his slender arms and legs, could manage such a large bird with ease. Yet, as the eagle owl gracefully landed on Blake's arm, all doubts were silenced. The shop assistant grimaced at the thought of eating the iron feed bag, a bet made in jest and now regretted. Blake, unfazed by the astonishment he had caused, simply blinked at the stunned shop assistant and exited Ira's owl shop with the owl perched on his arm. The onlookers were left in awe, murmuring among themselves about the boy's strength and the peculiar bond he seemed to share with the owl, which appeared to understand his words. Blake, however, was not swayed by their admiration. He had no interest in a cage for the owl, believing it deserved the freedom to roam outside. Let's get something done first. We'll have meat when we return, he said, handing a letter to the eagle owl, which promptly took off into the sky. With the owl dispatched, Blake muttered about the cold reception and hurried to Ollivander's magic wand shop, only to find a sign indicating it was temporarily closed. This was an unusual sight, as the shop was known for its steadfast operation. Inside, he found Mr. Ollivander looking significantly more worn than just a day before, as if the years had suddenly caught up with him. Ollivander, upon noticing, Blake asked for a moment to gather some final measurements for the wand's material. He handed Blake a peculiar ruler adorned with gemstones, instructing him to wave it with all his might. As Blake complied, the gems illuminated one by one until the ruler unexpectedly shattered. Ollivander, faced with the broken tool, mused that a traditional wooden wand might not suffice for Blake. Retreating to the back of the shop, Ollivander promised to return with a potential solution, hinting at the possibility of Blake receiving his unique wand that very day. Blake, though once would have been thrilled at the prospect, felt a subdued excitement. He already possessed a powerful wand, diminishing the anticipation of Ollivander's creation. Nevertheless, he respected the challenge Ollivander had presented, recognizing it as a mutual endeavor born from a shared passion for magic. As Blake waited, he idly flipped through a book on the table, while Baker stood silently in the corner, almost blending into the shadows, a quiet observer to the unfolding events. Chapter 38 Ollivander's Discovery Hiss A wand I don't recognize? The book Blake had stumbled upon was actually a notebook, filled with what appeared to be studies on wands. The handwriting was scribbled and chaotic, unmistakably the insights of Mr. Ollivander himself. Blake, respecting the privacy and potential trade secrets of the Ollivander family, decided it was best not to peruse the notebook without permission. After all, 
The Ollivanders had been in the wand business for generations, and it was possible that the notebook contained sensitive information. Just as Blake closed the notebook, Mr. Ollivander emerged from the back of the shop, holding a new wand. He noticed Blake's action, but dismissed it with a wave of his hand. Oh, it doesn't matter. You can read it, he said, revealing his plans to publish an introductory book on wand studies. The notebook was a draft of his upcoming publication. He encouraged Blake to read it and even try his hand at wand crafting with some materials he had set aside. You might have to stay here for a while today, Ollivander added, explaining that they had many tests to conduct. Blake, intrigued, accepted the wand Ollivander offered and waved it with force. To their surprise, all the gems on the wand lit up and it buzzed without exploding, a sign that they had finally found the right material for Blake's wand. Ollivander, visibly excited, hurried back to his workshop, leaving Blake to explore the manuscript. It was an easy read, covering the basics of wand studies, a subject Blake was already familiar with. However, his expertise in alchemy sparked several innovative ideas on combining wand crafting with alchemical principles. As Blake waited for Ollivander to return, he decided to experiment with the materials on a nearby workbench. His goal was to create a wand with enhanced attacking power. The workbench offered limited options, with only a small piece of ebony wood and a tuft of cheap, horse-shaped water monster mane available. Despite the mane being considered an inferior core material, it was perfect for a beginner's practice, as mentioned in Ollivander's manuscript. Undeterred by the lack of premium materials, Blake set to work with a carving knife. After some time, he held up a wand that, despite its humble components, was significantly improved through alchemy. Satisfied with his creation, Blake aimed to further enhance the wand's power through specific enchantments. As he delved deeper into his work, the initial boredom vanished, replaced by a sense of accomplishment and anticipation for the unique wand he was creating. Blake had recently learned about magical ancient texts, such as Niven, and decided to use alchemy to engrave them directly onto the inside of his wand. This was the simplest solution he could think of given the limited materials at his disposal. Ideally, he would have preferred to use a dragon heartstring for the core and mithril to embed the ancient runes, enhancing the wand's power with additional materials adaptable to magical energy. Holding the wand, Blake was eager to test its capabilities, despite its unassuming appearance. However, he was aware of the risks. Dumbledore had advised him to proceed with caution, reminding him that using other wands was an option, but the thought of his creation exploding due to insufficient control was daunting. This was his first attempt at wand making, and the prospect of failure was disheartening. After much deliberation, Blake decided against testing the wand himself. Instead, he turned his attention to a chocolate pudding served with a plate and a small spoon by his attentive house elf, Baker. Just then, the doorbell rang, signaling an unexpected visitor. Given that Mr. Ollivander had closed the shop for the day, Blake was surprised to see Cassandra enter. Why is it you again? Cassandra asked with a frown. Did you not want to see me? Blake replied, scratching his head, puzzled by her presence since he thought she had gone home. Cassandra explained she was there to pick up her custom knot made wand, prompting Blake to remember such an arrangement. He informed her that Mr. Ollivander was currently unavailable and suggested she wait. Despite her reluctance to spend more time with Blake, whom she found infuriating, Cassandra chose to stay, not wanting to appear intimidated. Observing Baker, Cassandra inquired if he was Blake's house elf, to which Blake confirmed and promptly sent Baker on an errand to fetch watermelon juice. Baker, eager to escape the drowsiness of standing idle, hurried out. Left alone with Cassandra, Blake considered making another wand, exploring a different concept. Curious about his activities, Cassandra couldn't help but ask what he was doing. Without waiting for her objection, Blake handed her the wand he had crafted and, mimicking Mr. Ollivander's voice, encouraged her to wave it. To their astonishment, a gentle breeze swept through the shop, lifting Cassandra's blonde hair and casting a radiant glow on her face. The wand seemed remarkably effective. Mr. Ollivander, emerging from the back, was surprised to see the wand in Cassandra's hand, recognizing that it was not one of his creations. Upon closer inspection, 
he noted its fresh appearance and the scent of wood, indicating it was newly made and yet to be finished with protective paint. This unexpected discovery left him intrigued, as he realized Blake had crafted a wand that perfectly suited Cassandra, challenging the traditional methods of wand making and hinting at Blake's untapped potential in the magical arts. In the realm of muscle and bone, the author has made a bold decision to release an abundance of chapters. While the standard for new books might be 1,500 words per chapter, this author has gone above and beyond, delivering 2,500 words per installment. It's clear that the author is putting in a tremendous amount of effort. So in appreciation of this hard work, let's show our support with flowers and tickets. Chapter 39, Cassandra's Astonishment. How can you know everything? What? You just learned this? A new wand. Ollivander stared at Blake in disbelief. It's still in my shop. Uh, didn't you mention I could use the materials there to practice? Blake scratched his head. You made this, Ollivander was astounded. That's correct. You've learned wand making before? Ollivander asked, surprised. Nope. I've only read a few books about it, Blake replied, then added. Then I tried making one. Ollivander's eyes widened in shock. You made this, with those materials? Yes, yes, Blake confirmed. Ollivander examined the wand once more. Its body was crafted from black sandalwood, and the core contained the mane of a horse-shaped water monster. Flowers bloom, Ollivander uttered, and a flower materialized at the wand's tip. This, Ollivander looked at Blake, amazed. You managed to craft a wand of such quality with such an unconventional core material, and on your first attempt, ding, detected emotions of shock. Ding, congratulations to the host for obtaining a silver treasure chest. To Ollivander, the wand's craftsmanship had some rough edges, yet it performed as well as any other wand, a feat that seemed almost illogical. I incorporated some alchemy knowledge, Blake explained, and I also referenced some ancient texts, engraving them inside the wand. Ollivander's interest was immediately piqued. Oh, which ancient texts did you use? He had experimented with blending alchemy and wand-making before, achieving impressive results. However, the idea of combining wand-making with ancient texts was entirely new to him. This revelation opened up a whole new field of study. As the elder and the young man engaged in their enthusiastic conversation, a clear cough interrupted them. Cassandra could no longer contain her frustration. Being overlooked once was tolerable, but twice was too much especially for someone of her talent and background in the magical community. Oh, cough, cough. I'm terribly sorry, Miss Worley, Mr. Ollivander said, clearly embarrassed by his oversight. It seemed that Blake's presence and his knack for surprises had inadvertently led to Cassandra being neglected. The wand specially crafted for you is ready. I'll fetch it now, Ollivander hurriedly said, moving behind the counter. Cassandra, observing Blake still examining his handmade wand, couldn't resist asking, Is this truly your first attempt at making a wand? That's correct. I was perusing Mr. Ollivander's manuscript in the shop, and after finishing, he suggested I could practice using the materials, Blake explained. Before he could continue, a fragrant breeze wafted by, and a figure sat down beside him. I want to try too. Uh, perhaps you should start with Mr. Ollivander's introductory manuscript. Blake suggested. Ding! Anger from embarrassment detected. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining a silver treasure chest. After receiving her wand, Cassandra didn't leave immediately. Instead of trying it out, she picked up Ollivander's manuscript and began reading it earnestly. Ollivander didn't mind. He had intended for others to review his introductory guide to gather feedback and understand if his explanations were clear. Blake had already read it, but his perspective was an outlier. Cassandra, being a true beginner, provided a fresh viewpoint. Once Ollivander had taken Blake's measurements, he returned to his work. Meanwhile, Baker entered the shop, carrying a tray with three glasses of watermelon juice. Little master, your watermelon juice is here. Okay, thank you for your hard work, Blake responded, casually picking up a glass of the juice. Oh, little master actually praised Baker, he said that Baker had worked hard. Blake halted the enthusiastic ramblings of his assistant with a firm command, urging him to deliver a glass of watermelon juice to Cassandra, who was deeply engrossed in her reading. After ensuring Cassandra received her drink,
Blake retreated to a corner with his O, when glass, savoring the juice in solitude. Cassandra, having finished her reading, approached the workbench with determination. She was resolved to surpass Blake in wand-making, despite being a novice. Wand-crafting, however, was no simple task, especially for someone with little experience in woodworking. The wand's body, crafted from magically potent wood, required precise, manual shaping, a skill Cassandra had yet to master. Blake, observing her struggle, offered guidance, correcting her technique, and advising her on the proper way to cut the wood. Initially resistant to his input, Cassandra soon realized she was out of her depth and begrudgingly accepted his help. Despite her efforts, the result was far from satisfactory. The wand was uneven, riddled with holes, and unintentionally curved, a stark contrast to the flawless wand Blake had produced. The comparison deepened Cassandra's frustration, highlighting her lack of skill. Yet, in that moment of defeat, she received an unexpected notification, a silver treasure chest, a small consolation for her efforts. Blake, observing her disappointment, reassured her that her attempt was commendable for a beginner. However, his modesty belied his true expertise, honed not only through practice, but also with the aid of a mysterious system that elevated his craftsmanship to professional levels. Taking Cassandra's flawed wand, Blake set to work, that his skilled hands swiftly correcting its imperfections. Cassandra watched in awe as the wand transformed under his touch, her frustration giving way to a mix of admiration and defeat. She couldn't help but question how Blake, who claimed to know only a little, could possess such remarkable skill, a skill that would surely astonish even the renowned wandmaker Mr. Ollivander. In that moment, Cassandra's resolve wavered, overshadowed by Blake's undeniable talent. A complex mix of emotions stirred within her, marking the beginning of a new chapter in their rivalry. Chapter 40, The Mithril Wand and the Seeds of Cassandra All right, it's finally complete, Mr. Ollivander exclaimed as he emerged from the back of the shop, interrupting Cassandra's deep thoughts. Give it a try, don't hold back, cast your spell with all your might. Blake set aside the carving knife and turned his attention to the wand in Ollivander's hand. It was a silver wand, about thirteen inches long, and appeared to be made of some kind of metal. As Blake took the wand, he noticed its heft. This wand was far from light. The wand's core is crafted from mithril, Ollivander announced. A wooden core simply couldn't withstand your full force casting. Initially, Blake felt comfortable holding the wand. He raised it, aiming at a stool beside the counter. With a swift motion, whoosh, the stool transformed into an exquisite sofa. Cassandra, witnessing the scene, clenched her teeth in frustration. Blake, surprised and pleased, examined the wand in his hand. It felt remarkably compatible with him, and crucially, it remained stable after he channeled his magic into it. No explosion ensued. Eager to test its limits, Blake raised the wand once more, this time exerting his full strength, both magically and physically. The wand sliced through the air, emitting a crisp buzz as it vibrated momentarily before settling down. Astonishingly, the wand withstood the powerful spell, and Blake could feel an enhancement in his magic, though not as significant as with a custom-defined wand. Nonetheless, it was a marked improvement over a standard wand. Ah, how wonderful. Mithril truly is an exceptional material, Ollivander mused. However, it's not suitable for everyone. Without sufficient magical power, Mithril will instead drain the user's magic. This wand is uniquely yours. No one else can wield it. Blake understood Ollivander's explanation. The wand was akin to a heavy broadsword, capable of fine precision but not meant for just anyone to wield. Later that evening, at the Leaky Cauldron, Dumbledore addressed Blake. Is this the house elf you mentioned, Blake? Yes, Blake nodded. I want him to stay. If he's sent back, he'll suffer greatly. Then he shall stay, Dumbledore agreed. Despite Grindelwald's dissatisfaction with sending a house elf, he recognized the thoughtfulness behind Blake's request. Having a house elf by Blake's side would ensure his well-being, a kindness that Dumbledore found commendable. Having acquired his wand, Blake had no reason to linger in Diagon Alley and planned to return to Godric's Hollow that night. His time in the alley had been fruitful, though he regretted not purchasing the seeds he had been contemplating. After dinner, Blake returned to his room to pack his luggage, only to find that Baker, the house elf, had already neatly packed everything. 
Blake smiled appreciatively at Baker, grateful for the convenience a house elf provided. Suddenly, the sound of flapping wings caught Blake's attention. An owl flew in through the window, landing on the table. Initially, Blake thought it was his eagle owl, but to his surprise, it was a smaller owl carrying a small cloth bag in its beak. After catching Blake's eye, the owl dropped the bag on the table and flew away. Curious, Blake opened the cloth bag to discover a large pile of seeds, the very ones he had been yearning for. Overwhelmed with joy, he quickly covered his mouth to stifle his excitement. Dumbledore would certainly confiscate these items if he saw them. Amidst the small bag's contents, a note caught Blake's attention. It read, I have plenty of these seeds at home. It seems you're the only one who hasn't explored the world enough to desire them so fervently. Considering your unfortunate situation, I've decided to pack some for you. Take them or leave them. It was signed, Cassandra Worley. Blake stared at the note, dumbfounded. The seeds he had longed for, which he believed were beyond his reach, had been casually sent to him by Cassandra. That night, Blake secluded himself in his room, quietly accessing the system space. He contemplated the nine silver treasure chests and the single golden treasure chest before him. The system had a peculiar way of awarding treasure chests. The stronger the target's personal ability and the more intense their emotions, the higher the likelihood of dropping treasure chests, especially those of higher quality. Essentially, luck played a crucial role. Despite Dumbledore's emotional involvement, there was still a chance of not receiving any treasure chests. Blake sighed, acknowledging the role of fortune in his recent endeavors. These past few days have been eventful, yet my luck has been dreadful. There should have been a higher chance of obtaining gold treasure chests or better, he lamented. Resolved not to dwell on his misfortune, Blake commanded, System, open all nine silver treasure chests at once. The system responded with a series of notifications. Congratulations to the host for achieving beginner mastery in magical zoology. Congratulations to the host for achieving beginner mastery in potions. Congratulations to the host for gaining 1,000 experience points in herbalism. Congratulations to the host for achieving beginner mastery in prophecy. Congratulations to the host for gaining 1,000 experience points in transformation. Congratulations to the host for obtaining advanced prophecy talent. Since the host already possesses superb prophecy talent, this reward has been converted to 1,000 experience points in prophecy. Congratulations to the host for gaining 1,000 experience points in potions. Congratulations to the host for obtaining 5,000 gold coins. Congratulations to the host for obtaining a mutated devil's web seed. Blake reviewed the rewards, his brow furrowing slightly at the mention of experience points, a term he hadn't encountered before in the system's notifications. This implied the existence of an experience bar within the system, but its location was unclear. Curious, he experimented with various commands, attempting to uncover more about this feature. Experience bar? No response. Skill experience? Still no response. Finally, he tried system panel? Ding! Opening the system panel for the host, a virtual screen materialized before him, but the information it displayed only deepened his frustration. Clenching his teeth, he demanded, System manual. Ding! System manual download failed. Blake's initial excitement over the treasure chest's rewards quickly turned to confusion and irritation as he grappled with the system's complexities and limitations.